dive. Do you remember Harvey Dent's slogan in The Dark Knight? Remember, as Bruce called it, he said, you know, the guy from those god-awful commercials with that god-awful slogan, I believe in Harvey Dent. Well, I believe in Mike Flanagan. Yeah. That's the easiest way for me to set this all up, is I believe in Mike Flanagan as a director, as a screenwriter, as a writer. Now, I didn't take note of Mike Flanagan until it was The Haunting of Hill House. Now, I've kept it simple in the past when I speak about The Haunting of Hill House, which was a Netflix original series based on uh, Shirley Jackson's novel of the same name. It is one of the finest acted, directed, written, just a shot dramas that's based in horror that I've seen in my entire life. And I've seen a lot of, you know, dramatic horror. Well, I've seen a lot of horrific drama for that matter. But whew, just the way the series grips you. And the way you get invested in these characters in this family. Simply put, it's just a superb series. Uh, but there was a secondary series. Uh, they were going for a uh, the same repertoire of actors kind of thing. The series was known as the Haunting series, so it was the follow-up. It's called The Haunting of Bly Manor. Now, The Haunting of Bly Manor is actually based on a novel called The Turn of the Screw. A, uh, a ghost story that's been adapted a handful of times. It's been adapted as a stage play. It's been shot uh, BBC. It's uh, uh, even like the others. Uh, it, it borrows a lot of themes and borrows a lot of uh, concepts from that. So The Haunting of Bly Manor, it was good. It was well done. The acting, everything, it was there, but it just wasn't as intriguing and it wasn't as gripping as Haunting of Hill House. And that's because the story itself has been adapted and borrowed from so many times that you kind of know already what's what, but you just need to see how it's going to get there. It's going to do it uniquely, uh, but it's not to take anything away from it uh, as far as the technical achievements, the acting and all that. But just to me personally, it's not as, as, uh, uh, profound as Haunting of Hill House. But that was when I first noticed his name. And I'd actually watched a lot of his filmography inadvertently. It just happened that way. Yeah, it wasn't something that I that I sought out. It just happened that way. But when I heard that his name was attached to Dr. Sleep and said, hey, the guy who did the Haunting Hill House is doing Dr. Sleep, which you don't know is the uh, follow-up to Stephen King's The Shining. It's the 40-year 40 <laughs> 40-year delayed sequel, the uh, cinematic sequel uh, to, to Stanley Kubrick's Shining. But if you go back and you'll see that uh, it actually wasn't the first time that he did an adaptation of Stephen King's work. He had done the short story called Gerald's Game, which on its face, like the little synopsis just says that it was like a married couple goes away for getaway weekend and they're, you know, having fun and they're doing a little S&M type of thing where the husband handcuffs the wife to the bed and then the husband proceeds to have a heart attack <laughs> and she can't get to the keys. So you got to think what could possibly go right and you think, well, how do you stretch an hour and a half film out of just a woman being chained to the bed? Well, just check it out and you'll see that it's a rather well-made film. It's uh, Carla Cugino and Bruce Greenwood. Yeah. Well, if you go back and you look at his filmography, you're going to run into Oculus, which well, now that we're here, this is all just going to lead to Horror Fest 2021. I might as well. And so it might be uh, Mike Flanagan centric right now. But this this is going to basically just be Horror Fest 2021. 
uh, there'll be just films that I think are like related thematically. They work, but yeah. Let's start with Oculus. Now, Oculus is interesting because it could have been, hell, it could have been an episode of Friday the 13th, the series. The real horror fans out there will know what I'm talking about when I talk about Friday the 13th, the I series. So. so, Oculus centers around a mirror, a cursed mirror called the Lasser Glass. And how they could have done a, a whole movie just about the Lasser Glass itself. I really wish there was ancillary and more more history to the Lasser Glass. Uh, within the movie itself, it gives you a history of where the glass has been, how, it, how it's traveled, how many different places it's been. But they could have really like went all out with more detail on that. Uh, but there's a... The deal with this, the, this, this cursed mirror, but there's a science element to it that's extremely intriguing. So that's why I happen to like it too. And if this cursed mirror drives people insane. This was an earlier film of his. He had done it originally as a short film. Uh, and the studios, uh, I guess, liked this so much that they wanted a full-length feature. And Flanagan actually didn't know how he was going to turn this little 15, 20 minute movie into a, a full length feature. But what he decided to do was uh, uh, work flashbacks into what was going on currently. And then you'll see that he uses that narrative in a lot of his films where you're getting a lot of flashbacks to tell a story, which, you know, like any good novel, right? Uh, but yeah, he incorporates flashbacks into the narrative and then what's currently going and juxtapose what's going on. Next up, and what I meant about matching things up like thematically or what, you know, six degrees of whatever, right? So, uh, Katie Sackhoff, who, you know, sci-fi fans know from Battlestar Galactica, from The Flash, she's in Oculus. So, in Oculus? She stars in Oculus. And then from there, she's in a film that's called Don't Knock Twice. Check that out next. And then after Don't Knock Twice... Launch lights out, and then you'll see what I mean with the, the, the theme or just the feel for it, you know. But that also leads me to a current film that released on HBO Max a few weeks ago. It's called uh, Malignant, and it's directed by James Wan. You know, they, the director who's behind, well, yeah, most of the times a, a single word title horror film. He's just been responsible for deluge of movies over the past, but most importantly, the Conjuring series. And at first, it was slow going. I was trying to figure out what direction they were going in. All right. Like I say, was it worth the watch? Yeah, it's in there. You can watch it. You know, you won't feel too bad after watching it. But I didn't know what kind of, you know, horror film they were going for, what it was going to be as far as, you know, supernatural. Is it, you know, you'll have to check it out yourself. But the, the thing that did it for me, what made me interested was there's the trailer and in this trailer we're watching someone flee from some entity or whatever's in pursuit of them and we're getting a a top-down view of a house like the roof's off and we're watching them run from room to room and that tracking shot from above just intrigued me that was cool as hell so you know i checked it out in the long run yeah you can go ahead and check it out and they throw some some ultra violence in there too. Like that was the thing. It's got your handful of tropes in it, especially with the cops, the detectives that are working the case. But the violence is there. I guess that's what he wanted to go for because he's never made like a super gory, violent film. Unless you count all the soft, saw films that he produced. Okay. Next up on the opposite end of it. St. Maud. <sighs> yeah, St. Maud. Now, let me preface this with saying, hey, I give everyone credit. that They, pretty, they write these films. They, they have their dreams to come to fruition. So I understand that I'm not knocking the movie making and the accomplishment that they did. They've done more than me. What do they say? Those who can't criticize. And it's not even that I have an issue with the film. The acting's good. It's put together well. Cinematography. But it's a whole lot of nothing. There may be like three things that happen throughout the movie. But I think what really bothers me the most are the reviews when you see little things like this little trite comments like this when there's completely exaggerating and then it just makes you think well it's not a legitimate review it's just a blurb from you know it's just a blurb because the film's distributed by the same like media warehouse that you know the media company that owns or distributes the film so they they uh, throw these bs reviews out there to get people in there because 
cross platform and cross promotion, but it's A24 films that produced it. So it was no shock to me. A24 is famous, to me at least, for doing a bunch of horror movies that have where nothing happens, like whatsoever at all. Slow as balls. Right. Let's just get back to Mike Flanagan a little bit. The real reason that I'm here. So next up for him with Netflix was yeah you see it midnight mass that's my highest recommendation for this year in particular it it takes a little bit to get going i think it's only seven episodes but by the end of the third episode you finally get the hook after trying to put the mystery together you finally get the hook and then once the following episode ends and it's just on and you know what directions the, the film's going you you don't know what's going to happen, but you know where you're at now. <sighs> Give it a chance. I can remember when I was watching it, my niece came out and she asked, well, how is it? And uh, coincidentally, the two characters are on the screen. One of them said to the other, eh, just take it slow or it's going slowly or something like that. And I was like, yeah, it's appropriate. They just answered you. But um, even though it was slow, <sighs> yeah, that build up, that payoff was definitely worth it. This one I went in cold too. I had no idea it was even like on the horizon. But what happened was uh, the original poster, which you see right here, the thumbnail was replaced by something that I guess would maybe hook people's attention a little bit more so. And that may give away a little more than, well, it does give away more than what the original poster showed. I know if they did that on purpose to try and intrigue more freaking people. Without revealing anything whatsoever about the particular plot of uh, Midnight Mask. And this is, this is why I say I believe in Mike Flanagan. This is what the guy has, the, the knack for. It's just, it seems like it's limitless, it's boundless. The way that he understands how to intertwine the dramatic with the horrific. And I uh, imagine if you take a uh, deep-rooted family drama, a drama where you're, you're dealing with human interaction, people interacting with one another, and then once you get all these things, all the relationships, once you work out all the dynamics and what type of story you're telling, then you go in and then you pepper it and you add the horror element to it. But between uh, Doctor Sleep, uh, there's another film of his. It's called uh, Before I Wake. Um, and then you take The Haunting of the Hell House and you take Midnight Mass, and it's just this. The human element, when you might deal with people who are struggling with addiction, you're dealing with uh, addiction recovery, but just like loss and, and grief. And you take all these things, wrap them together, and you pace it so the viewers are emotionally invested in the characters and the story and what's going on. And that you're waiting for the payoff. You want to see what's, what's going to happen. You want to feel it whenever you lose a character. So just the fact that you could create characters in a small short, you know, the short space of time that you can get attached to. And then when you lose them, you're, you know, number one, maybe you're not expecting it. But when you do lose them, it tugs on the heartstrings when you've only known the character for who knows, 40 minutes or something like that. Coping with grief, coping with addiction recovery. And to frame it around horror. Which it's appropriate. But that's what he has an absolute knack for. And hasn't dropped the ball. We could just go straight horror too. You know, we're talking slasher flicks or whatever. But but you take something like uh, Hush. Now, I've, you know, I've talked to a couple of people about Mike Flanagan and... You know, of course, they wouldn't know his name right off or whatever, but if I I, I state movies and I say Hush, I'm like, oh, shit, yeah, they saw Hush on Netflix, and it was awesome. I was like, yeah. That was something that he actually wrote with with uh, Kate Siegel, who is his his, his uh, wife now. Uh, she's actually starred in a handful of, you know, productions with him. Uh, yeah, he's just got it. So I'm always looking forward to whatever he, he's involved with. I think the next project... I saw he was involved with is a uh, 
miniseries based on the fall of the House of Usher from the Edgar Allan Poe classic story. And I'm stoked. So do yourself a favor this Halloween. And that's that's my horror fest 2021 list. Mike Flanagan centric list there with some extras thrown in there. Die. How many times did I say intrigued?